Some datasets have more features than a given model can handle. In that case, there are two things we can do. We can try to find a subset of the features that is most informative and operate on those. This has the benefit that the features retain their meaning and are still interpretable, and we call this feature selection. The alternative is to take information from all features and map them to a new, smaller set of derived features, which retain as much of the original information as possible. This is called dimensionality reduction. In this case, the new features don't always have an obvious meaning, but they may still work well for machine learning purposes. In this video, we'll look at just one dimensionality reduction method, principal component analysis, or PCA. Dimensionality reduction is the opposite of the feature expansion trick we saw earlier. It describes methods that reduce the number of features in our data, the dimension, by deriving new features from the old ones, hopefully in such a way that we capture all the essential information. There are several reasons why you might want to reduce the dimensionality of your data. First, as I've already mentioned, efficiency. Many machine learning methods can only handle so many features, and if you have a very high dimensional data set, you may be forced to do some dimensionality reduction in order to be able to run your chosen model. Secondly, you may want to reduce the variance of the model performance. That is, make the bias variance trade-off more towards bias than towards variance. Feature expansion boosts the power of your model, likely giving it a higher variance and a lower bias. And dimensionality reduction does the opposite. It reduces the power of your model, likely giving you a higher bias and a lower variance. And lastly, you may want to visualize your data. If you're lucky, or if you have a very strong dimensionality reduction methods, then reducing down to just two or three dimensions still preserves a lot of the important information in your data. If so, you can do a scatter plot and use the power of your visual cortex to analyze your data. In other words, you can look at it. So let's look at how this principal component analysis works. To simplify our explanation, We'll start by reducing our data to just one dimension. For each instance, we'll try to come up with a single number z that hopefully represents it pretty well. The way we'll do this is by optimizing the reconstruction error. We'll come up with some function that reconstructs our data from the reduced point z, and the closer this reconstruction is to the original point, the better. We'll add the constraint that both the function that reduces the data and the function that reconstructs the data should be linear. We'll also assume that the data is mean-centered so that we won't need to apply any translations. The mean of the original data, the reduced data, and the reconstructed data is zero or the zero vector. Under these constraints, the reduction function consists of taking the dot product of our vector with some parameter vector, which we'll call C prime for now. And the reconstruction function consists of multiplying our reduced representation with some parameter vector c. Note that because our reduced representation z lie on a line and our reconstruction function is linear, the reconstructions also lie on a single line. Here we have a diagram for a single instance. Since each reconstruction is a multiple of c, the line that the reconstructions lie on is the line that the vector c points along. We'll work out what our function should be in the following order. First, we will assume that we have the reconstruction function and then ask what the best reduction function is to use in terms of that reconstruction function. Then we will work out an optimization objective for both of them together. So let's assume that we have a reconstruction function. That is, we have the vector c already. Given that, what value should we then choose for z to give us the best reconstruction? The closest we can get x prime to x is to put x prime where the line between x and x prime makes a right angle with the line of c. This is the projection of x onto c. And if you know your linear algebra, you'll know that the length of z times c in this picture is related to the dot product of x and c. Why is that? Well, for our purposes, the length of c doesn't matter. If we make c longer or shorter, it still defines the same length. So we'll assume that c has length 1. That is, it's a unit vector. Using that, we can apply basic trigonometry 
and work out that the length of the black line in this picture is the length of x times the cosine of the angle between x and c. Because the length of c is 1, we can add that to the expression without changing its value. And then we can note that what we have here is the definition of the dot product in trigonometric terms. This means that to minimize the reconstruction error, the distance from the origin to x prime should be equal to the dot product between x and c. And since the magnitude of c is 1, that is exactly the value that we should multiply by c to get our reconstruction. In other words, the value z that we were looking for. So given some value of c, this is how we should compute z. So this is how we've now simplified our picture. The vector c in our reconstruction function and in our reduction function are the same. So all we need to do now is find the specific c that gives us the lowest reconstruction error. Before we do that, let's look at what this looks like on a more realistic data set. Here are some data. And what we'll do is we'll pick an arbitrary c, an arbitrary direction in this space, and see what the data looks like when we project it down onto that vector. Here it is. The red points are our reconstructions. And for each point, the new feature z is the distance from the origin to the red point. The gray lines indicate how far the reconstruction is from the original data. The gray lines indicate how far the reconstructions are from their original data points. Clearly, this is not a very good choice for C. The gray lines could be much shorter. And this is how we'll optimize for C. We'll sum up the squares of the lengths of these gray lines and minimize those. Intuitively, we can think of optimizing for C as making the gray lines rubber bands that pull on the line representing C, which pivots around the origin. This is a lot like linear regression, but the task is slightly different. Note that we don't have a target attribute here. We are merely looking to learn a representation of the data. To find C, we will simply state our goal as an optimization objective. We want to find the vector C for which the squared distance between the data and the reconstructed data is minimized. Note that we're using the square of the distance between x prime and x. We'll first fill in the definition of the reconstruction, which is z times c, and then the definition of the optimal z, which is the dot product of x with c. Note that the center dot represents a simple multiplication of a scalar by a vector and not a dot product. We can fill in the definition of the Euclidean distance and note that the square root cancels out against the square in our optimization objective, so that we are left with a sum of the squares over every dimension i in every instance x. This leaves us with a simple objective to which we can apply any search algorithm like gradient descent. One thing we must remember, which is that we assumed that c is a unit vector. This means that we have an optimization problem with a constraint. We should only consider solutions where the magnitude of c equals 1. Optimization under constraints is a technical subject that we'll see more of in lecture 6, but for now we can solve this problem by applying gradient descent and normalizing the vector c after every gradient update. This is called the projection method for constraint optimization, and it doesn't always work, but it does here. So if we do this, we run gradient descent, then this is the solution that we find. It looks pretty good. It's hard to imagine any other line C leading to shorter gray lines. And indeed, C is uniquely defined by this optimization objective. We call C the first principal component of the data. If we want to reduce our data to more than a single dimension, we can repeat the process. We keep the first principal component fixed, and the second principal component is then the one orthogonal to the first that minimizes the reconstruction loss given the two reduced dimensions. Each next principal component is the direction orthogonal to all the previous ones that minimizes the loss when the data is reconstructed using all of them. If you've heard about PCA before, you may be surprised by this definition using reconstruction loss. Usually, the principal components are defined as the directions in which the variance of the projected data is maximized. The first principal component is then the line 
along which the variance of the data is maximal when projected onto the line. The second principal component is the line orthogonal to the first, for which the variance is maximal, and so on. It turns out these two definitions are equivalent. Least squares minimization is equivalent to variance maximization. To understand this, let's look at the one-dimensional reduction again. The variance of a one-dimensional dataset is defined as the average of the squares of all the distances to the data mean. In our case, both the data and the reduction are mean-centered, so the variance is just the sum of all the squares of the z's, our reduced representations. In this picture, in this picture, the length of the orange vector. Thus, maximizing the variance means choosing c so that the squared length of the orange vector is maximized when summed over all data points. This arrangement that we see here into a right angle triangle means that the blue vector, the magnitude of the original data, is related to the variance of the projected data, the orange vector, and the reconstruction error, the black vector, by the Pythagorean theorem, seen above. Since p, the magnitude of the original data, is a constant, q squared plus r squared is also a constant, and minimizing the squared reconstruction error r squared is equivalent to maximizing the variance of the projected data q squared. In this setting, where we're maximizing the variance, we often talk about how much variance the reduced training data retains, seeing the variance as a kind of information content in a representation of the data. A perfect reconstruction has the same total variance as the data. To apply PCA, we need to choose the number of dimensions to reduce to. We can just treat this as a hyperparameter and test different values. But to help us out, if we plot the variance or the reconstruction loss against the number of components, we often see a natural inflection point. In this case, we can retain the majority of the variance in the data by keeping only the first three principal components. The higher components, numbers 4 and up, add a very small amount of variance each, but not much. So what happens if we keep adding components until the new data has the same number of features as the original? So we apply PCA, but we don't actually reduce the number of dimensions. If we do that, we get perfect reconstructions. But our z's are still different from the original coordinates. We end up expressing the data in another basis, and it turns out that this actually gives us a whitening of the data. In the new basis, the data is uncorrelated, and we can then easily rescale it to give it variance 1 along each axis. This way of whitening is called PCA whitening. We apply PCA with the same number of target dimensions as data dimensions, and this gives us an orthonormal basis in which the data is uncorrelated, if we then measure the standard deviation along each component and multiply the basis vectors by that, we get a basis in which the data is whitened. Note that while sigma and c together do not form an orthonormal basis, c by itself does. Therefore, we can still easily transform back and forth between the whitened basis and the original data coordinates. If you've heard about PCA before, you may be wondering why I haven't discussed eigenvectors or singular value decompositions. These topics are only necessary if you want to know the deeper workings of PCA, and if you want to compute it efficiently. Computing PCA by gradient descent, one component at a time, is illustrative, but in practice there are far more efficient and precise ways to do it. So, to recap, principal component analysis is a linear transformation to a low-dimensional space that minimizes reconstruction loss, or equivalently, that maximizes variance. It can also be used as a whitening transformation, and it orders dimensions by either the amount of variance captured or the reconstruction loss. That is, the first dimension is the most important for reconstructing the data, then the second, and so on. This may seem like a lot of math for something so simple as reducing the dimensionality of a data set, but it turns out that these principal components are actually extremely versatile and can give us a lot of insight into our data. We'll start with an example of how PCA is often used in research. Imagine that you're a paleontologist, and while out on a dig, you find a shoulder bone belonging to some great ape. If you're a trained anatomist specializing in primates, you can easily tell for a single shoulder bone whether it's an early hominin fossil, which is a very rare find, or a chimpanzee fossil, which isn't rare at all. But how do you then substantiate this when you report your find? Saying that it's true because you can see that it's true is not very scientific. 
Here's one common approach. We take a large collection of the same specific bone, in this case the scapula or shoulder blade, from different apes and humans. And on each, we take a bunch of measurements, i.e. features. We do a principal component analysis, and we plot the first two principal components. As you can see, the different species form very clear clusters, even in two dimensions. When we then find a new fossil, we can see where it ends up in this space. And we can then show that what we found is clearly closer to human than to chimp just by measuring it and projecting it into this space. When we, find it, when we find a new fossil, we can then show that what we found is clearly closer to human than to chimp by just measuring it and projecting it into this space. Note also that this data gives us some clues about how humans might have developed. Proto-humans, Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus sediba, are both on a straight line between the cluster of bonobos, chimps and gorillas and the point where modern humans are. These three are indeed the great apes considered to be the most like the ones from which we developed. Here's another example of what PCA can tell us about a high-dimensional dataset. In this research, the authors took a database of 1,387 Europeans and extracted features from their DNA. They used about half a million sites on the DNA sequence, where the DNA varies among humans. So in this dataset, there are about 1,300 instances, which are people, and about half a million features, which are DNA markers. They also recorded where their subjects or their immediate ancestors were from. Only the DNA data was then fed to a PCA algorithm, with the person's origin only used afterwards to color the points. And what we see here are the first two principal components of that data set. And it turns out that the first principal component largely expresses how far north the person lives, and the second principal component expresses how far east the person lives. This means that if you scatter plot the data in the first two principal components, you get a fuzzy picture of Europe. In short, the large-scale geography of Europe can be extracted from our DNA. If I sent a sample of European DNA to some aliens on the other side of the galaxy who had never seen our planet, they could use it to get a rough idea of our geography. Finally, possibly the most magical illustration of PCA, eigenfaces. Here we have a dataset, which you can easily get yourself from the SK Learn library, containing 400 images in 64 by 64 grayscale of a number of people. The lighting is nicely uniform, and the facial features are always in approximately the same place. We take each pixel as a feature, giving us 400 instances, each represented by a 4096 dimensional feature vector. The prefix eigen in eigenfaces comes from the eigen decomposition often used to derive the PCA analysis. It's out of scope for us, but you can read more about this in the suggested reading. Here is the sample mean of our data, rearranged back into an image, the mean phase of the data. Once we have the principal components, each represented by a 4096 dimensional vector, we can take their values, assign them a color, like red for negative values and blue for positive values, and rearrange them back into images. Because remember, every dimension represents a pixel. These, then, are the first 30 principal components displayed in this way. Top left is the first, to the right of that is the second, and so on. Here is one way to interpret the principal components. If we think of our data as a cloud of points in this high-dimensional space, then the first principal component is the direction in which the variance is maximized. To illustrate what happens in this direction, we can start at the mean and take small steps in the direction of the principal component. Here's what that looks like. The face in the middle is close to the mean, and moving to the right, we add increasingly large multiples of the first principal component, and moving to the left, we subtract increasingly large multiples of the first principal component. And what we see is when we move along the first principal component, it roughly corresponds to aging the face. The second principal component we see that moving in this direction, in our data space, changes the lighting from being lit on the left to being lit on the right. Moving along the third principal component changes the image from one with glasses to one without glasses. Moving along the fourth, from masculine to feminine. Since the principal components are directions in our data space, we can also apply them to the instances of our data and see what happens then. Here again, 
are the first five principal components applied to an arbitrary instance in our data. And in this case, pay particular attention to what happens when we subtract or add the fifth principal component. Note that all the way on the left, the mouth is slightly open with the lips curled inwards. And on the right, the lips are firmly pressed together, curling outwards. When we want to reconstruct our data using the principal components, we can think of this as an iterative process. We start at the mean, we add the required amount of the first principal component, which gives us a reasonable reconstruction. And to improve that reconstruction, we add the required amount of the second principal component. And we keep going, increasing our reconstruction with every step. If we think of our principal components as a new basis for our data, by first moving some distance along the first axis, then along the second axis, and so on. Just like we would when we look up a point given its coordinates in the standard basis. Here's what that looks like. Top left is the mean. To the right of that is the reconstruction from just the first principal component. To the right of that is what we get when we add the second principal component, and so on. And we see that after 60 principal components, the image starts to look pretty recognizable. We've reduced our data from 4,096 dimensions to just 60 dimensions. And we've still retained enough information to tell people apart. So that's BCA, a dimensionality reduction method constrained to using linear transformations. And we'll discuss nonlinear versions later on. And we can think of the principal components as a natural basis for our data. And this is not just a good way of reducing the dimensionality, it's also a good way of getting insight into your data. And as we said at the start of the lecture, looking at your data and getting insight into what it looks like is an important first step in any machine learning project. In the next lecture, we'll return to building models. And specifically, we'll look at what probability theory can do for us in describing classifiers and regression models.